Welcome everybody. Welcome to the USC Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness. This is our quarterly symposium. Thank you so much for signing up. We have a very exciting agenda today with two renowned speakers in the area of culinary medicine and also in the area of intermittent fasting. And so um, I will say just a few words. One, uh, we are recording this, so hopefully everybody's okay with that. And it will be and sent to you as a link so you can review it at a later time if you want to. And it'll also be posted on our website, the USC IIHW website. Um, and again, uh, my name is Jeffrey Gold, and I am a pediatric psychologist based at USC and Children's Hospital, representing our USC Institute for Integrative Health and Wellness as the current director. And I just wanted to say what our mission is for some of you who are new to our institute. Um, the mission is to promote the health and the healing of individuals, families, and our shared communities that we serve through the advancement of practice and also evidence base, uh, which is transmitted through education and healthcare practitioners into the USC community, as well as our surrounding communities locally and nationally. So I wanna thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, the title of our talk today, as you know, is to eat or not to eat. And I'll encourage you to, I don't know if Nat has put it into the chat yet. Yeah, if you look in the chat, if you are not part of our uh, listserv or our mailing list and you'd like to be part of that, please sign up. You can click on that and just fill out your information. And we'd love to have you as part of our community. Um, our goal is to have quarterly seminars where we're able to provide virtual lectures to our communities, again, uh, near and far, as well as uh, uh, other types of educational programs, clinical programs, and research activities. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. We actually had 200 people register for this event with only like two weeks of advertising. So I'm thrilled that, you know, so many people have, have seen this as a very important topic and two very prominent speakers, Dr. Menahu um, Hardas Malani and Dr. Walter Longo. And so we're really excited to hear from both of them today. We will be starting with Dr. Madhu Haras Malani, and I hope I haven't slaughtered her name too much. I'm sure she'll give me a little bit of <laughs> some wiggle room there. Uh, no, 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 that was absolutely fine. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, so Dr. Haras uh, Malani is a pediatric urgentologist at Kaiser Downey with special fellowship training in integrative healthcare from the Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. She is currently on faculty lecturing pediatric integrative medicine in the residency department at LAC USC Keck School of Medicine. So without any further ado, um, she will speak first. Um, we'll load up her slides. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're all very excited to hear your lecture and to learn about culinary medicine. Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for that um, for inviting me to speak on this topic today. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so for the next 20 minutes, uh, we will be talking about food and we'll be talking quite a bit about food. So food obviously is for the sustenance of any organism, you know, and for the past two decades or so, the food industry has really expo exploded. We have access to so many different types of cuisines now, correct? I mean, there is all kinds of cuisines because of globalization, thanks to that. Today, but we'll discuss a different aspect of food. We will discuss the nutritional values of food and, and briefly discuss this field of culinary medicine. In reality, this field is not new. You know, our parents, grandparents, and even us from different cultures practice this you know, to varying degrees and in different ways. The difference now that we have research backing many of these practices. Now we have research which is backing the anti-inflammatory properties of olive oil, you know, the immune enhancing properties of turmeric, the anti-thrombotic properties of fatty fish and so on. So we have been practicing this, now we just have proof. Next. So many of you may have heard of the blue zones of the world. These are basically five places around the world where people consistently live healthy uh, over 100 years of age. And what was noted was that there were certain unique aspects in the lives of these people, like spirituality, exercise was built in the daily activities, but a common thread is their diet. They eat a plant-forward diet. 
Meat is eaten sparingly, only five times a month, if at all. So this goes to show the diet and the food we consume does impact our health and longevity. Next slide, please. So what is culinary medicine? The art and science of cooking, marry it with the art and science of medicine and you get culinary medicine. It is an evidence-based medicine, we have proof now. Its main aim is to assist people access and eat high quality meals to prevent and to, uh, or to treat illness. It takes into account not only how food works in the body, but it also looks at, um, emphasizes the social cultural aspects, the pleasurability, the availability of foods, and also looks into um, um, areas such as social determinants, uh, food insecurities that affect a person's health. You know, we are, uh, we may tell our patients to avoid fast foods, you know, buy some grocery, you know, get some fresh uh, vegetables and fruits, but if they cannot afford to buy, or they have to change to a uh, means of public transportation to get to a grocery store. So that's not going to work. So we have to keep all these barriers in mind. Next slide, please. Um, and the demand for culinary medicine is on rice. You know, um, some eating patterns have been found to be as effective or even more effective than prescription drugs, right, for certain illnesses. Our neurology colleagues, um, you know, they use the ketogenic diet for their hard to treat seizure patients. Uh, the Mediterranean diet, with all its goodness, you know, it's found to be great for cardiovascular disease, for colon cancer prevention, for type 2 diabetes, and so forth. Uh, that the dietary approach is to stop hypertension, you know, that diet to control and to prevent uh, the occurrence of hypertension in the first place. Then tree nuts, you know, 50 grams of eating walnuts every day has been shown to improve the laboratory parameters of metabolic syndrome, the triglycerides, and better insulin sensitivity. Um, you know, fish with all its goodness of omega-3 fatty acids, and we are talking here of the baked or the broiled fish, not necessarily the fat, the, the fried fish. You know, baked and broiled fish has been shown to improve cardiac function in heart failure patients. And many pediatricians in this group can attest to we use honey, we recommend honey uh, for uh, acute cough, um, especially in our uh, pediatric population. Next slide, please. So the principles, so culinary medicine is based on three basic principles. Number one is food nutrients should be bioavailable. Now bioavailability is a term we use quite a bit in medicine, right? What is the bioavailability of the drug? You know, similarly in culinary medicine, how bioavailable are the nutrients in the food that we consume? What aspects of cooking or what are the food combinations which will enhance it so that we can reap the benefits? So we'll talk about that. Second is the food should be devoid of anti-nutrients. And this is a big one, especially in these times, right? There is so much stuff that is not good for our bodies. And we have a lot of this in our food and in our environment from high fructose corn syrup to artificial sweeteners to trans fats, the list is quite long. So what do we do to avoid these? And the third principle is that the food should be appealing, right? It should look good, it should smell good, and obviously it should taste good or else we will not stick to healthy foods and we should feel satisfied. It's not that after, after a meal, we are hungry in the next hour or two and we are snacking. Because snacking, we don't make healthy choices when we, when we are snacking, that is a given. Next slide, please. And where does it all begin? It begins in the kitchen. You know, kitchen is the heart of your home as well as it's the heart of your health. This is where healing starts. You know, we, we, we try to keep it clean, clutter free, free, and, you know, cook with love because the health, your health and your family's health begins here. And the pantry is our kitchen pharmacy, isn't it not? You know, for colds and sniffles, we may go for some over-the-counter meds, but we usually reach out to the pantry to get some warm ginger tea. Many of us will reach out to turmeric in our pantry to get uh, to add to our curries, to our soups. So the choices that we make in the kitchen pharmacy, AKA pantry, can take us towards or can take us away from health. Next slide, please. So coming to the first principle of bioavailability, you know, this is even more important now. Why? Because the nutrient content of our food has significantly decreased over the years. There was an interesting study by Dr. Davis um, in 2004, um, you know, from University of Texas, where he looked he and his colleagues looked at 13 nutrients in 43 crops. 
including the high yield crops like um, you know wheat and broccoli. And what they found was six out of those 13 nutrients were significantly less in our foods from 1950 to 1999. And now with the climate change, with the rising uh, carbon dioxide levels, these nutrient levels have actually significantly reduced more. So we are working with a lot less of nutrients. So we need to make them bioavailable to our bodies so that we can reap the benefits of uh, you know, the vitamins and nutrients. Next slide, please. So um, bioavailability is, you know, there are a lot of factors which affect the bioavailability of, our, of the nutrients in our food. Um, you know, the first one is how much you eat. This is an obvious one. You eat more of donuts, you're going to get more of those, you know, bad stuff in your system. You eat more of blueberries, you're going to get more of that. So this is an obvious one. Uh, the second principle, the second factor that bioavailability depends on is the combination of foods. You know, we know that iron, iron is better absorbed with vitamin C. So pairing iron-rich foods with vitamin C foods, uh, foods such as citrus will enhance the absorption of iron. Curcumin and turmeric, you know, that's the one that has the, 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 the anti-inflammatory properties. Curcumin and turmeric is better uh, absorbed almost 2,000%. If you cook turmeric in oil and you add a pinch or two of uh, black pepper with it, that increases its absorption and you will reap the anti-inflammatory benefits of curcumin. Uh, recently, there was a study published in the Journal of Gastroenterology where they showed that curcumin from turmeric and quercetin from onions, if you combine these two, the number of polyps, a colon polyps in patients with familial colonic polyposis decreases. So, you know, combining when you're cooking, you know, cooking with onions and turmeric together, you know, it's going to help with the colon health. The third factor is how is the food cooked? Obviously, you're going to steam it, you're going to stir fry it. It's ideal for most vegetables. If you're going to fry it, then yeah, you're going to lose all those, you know, potent antioxidants. And if you're going to boil the food, but you're going to discard the, the fluid, then again, you know, all those fragile, you know, vitamins and minerals will be lost. So making sure to use that as a stock, don't just toss it away. The fourth factor is what time of the day you eat. You know, our digestive system follows the sun. So the peak is between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. So lunch should be our main meal. Breakfast should be just that, you know, to break the fast, light. Um, and then dinner, you know, um, try to have an early dinner, preferably before sunset. Um, and it should be light, but enough to carry you through the night. It's not that you're waking up in the middle of the day at uh, 11 p.m. or 12 uh, midnight to, afford to have a midnight snack. So time of the day is very important to when you're looking at the bioavailability of nutrients. And then last, but definitely not, not the least, and this is a big one for me, is how we eat. You know, for digestion and assimilation, we need to switch from the sympathetic mode to the parasympathetic rest and digest mode. That is very important. So sitting and eating mindfully with gratitude and reverence for food helps to achieve that. Um, so being mindful of, you know, your, your meal times um, is very important. Next slide, please. Um, you know, one question that frequently gets asked in culinary medicine is organic, are organic foods uh, better than conventional foods, nutritionally better? And um, there has been a lot of research in this area. Uh, and we're going to talk about uh, some of the research papers that have been uh, published in this field. Um, in 2012, Smith and colleagues conducted a systematic review of 17 human studies and 223 studies of nutrient and contaminant levels in foods. And what we concluded was that organic foods are not more nutritious than conventional foods. However, the pesticide residues and antibiotics are much less um, in patients, uh, in people who primarily have an organic diet. So, you know, not nutritionally better, but anti-nutrients are way less. Next slide, please. 
Then in 2014, Baranski, he conducted a systematic review uh, and meta-analysis where, where he analyzed 343 peer-reviewed publications about crop compositions. And what they found was that organic foods are significantly better, nutritionally better than conventional food. They have more antioxidants, more phytonutrients in organic foods, and the pesticide level is four times less. And the toxic metals like cadmium was also significantly less in organic foods than conventional foods. So this was like a positive study um, in 2014. But the debate has continued and there have been several more studies in this field. And as late as um, in 2020, next slide please. Uh, Vanessa Vigor et al. Uh, they did a systematic review um, of conventional versus organic food consumption on human health, which was in nutrients in January of 2020. And what she looked at was 20 observational studies and 15 interventional studies. And yes, there were positive outcomes in the observational studies in several areas, right? But these were observational studies, you know, people who eat organic food have healthy, overall healthy dietary other practices, you know, so were those the confounding factors? So they were not very conclusive as, uh, you know, in, in regards to whether it really is uh, promoting uh, better health outcomes uh, with organic diet. But pesticide excretion, again, was consistent, consistently shown to be, bred, to be less in patients who um, had primarily an organic diet. So in short, organic foods are not necessarily more nutritious, but there is less pesticide uh, load. And for me, that is, you know, one principle of healthy medicine is satisfied beautifully here. You're not going to get too much of anti-nutrients. But organic food, uh, you know, if you buy everything organic, it will get pr pretty pricey. And especially if you are giving this advice to our uh, patient population, you know, it's not going to be um, very fruitful. They're not going to stick to it. So what I do is I usually refer to the Environmental Working Group uh, website. If you, if you, many of you may be familiar with the EWG website. Next slide, please. So when in doubt, go chemical free, um, but uh, EWG is a well-known organization that takes information from USDA and categorizes produce to dirty dozen, the ones with the most pesticide residue and the clean 15, the ones with the least pesticide residue. So if you're going to do apples, go for the organic, but if you want to do papaya or asparagus, then conventional is going to be okay. You don't have to spend the extra money to get um, organic papaya. Next slide, please. Um, another question that comes up in culinary medicine is, do we need to cook food at all? Is raw diet better than cooked, cooked diet for bioavailability? And here the answer is not that simple. According to Guy Crosby, who is the food scientist from Harvard, um, he says it's not that simple. It depends upon two main factors. Is one is how is the food cooked? That is very important. You know, heat itself can be destructive. So if you're cooking on high heat, you're probably losing a lot of the fragile uh, nutrients. But with raw diets, there's a lot of uh, pressure, or your digestive system needs to work a lot to break the cell walls and help assimilate. And many of these phytonutrients or antioxidants, they stick, you know, they are very um, adhered or, or they are stuck to the cell membranes and cooking kind of helps to release them. So if you're not going to cook it, those phytonutrients may be lost. Uh, you will not be able to absorb them as well. Um, and then, you know, what nutrients, the other factor is what nutrients are you looking to absorb? So, for example, you know, lycopene is a potent antioxidant found in, raw, in tomatoes, um, and it's found to be, it's researched to be uh, very useful in prevention and also the treatment of prostate cancer. So, if you're looking to enhance your prostate health by ingesting um, lycopene, then you need to cook the tomatoes because raw tomatoes, lycopene will not be released. So, it needs to be cooked in oil for the lycopene to be released from the tomatoes for you to absorb. Uh, curcumin, we have mentioned this, this is, you know, for, for it to be absorbed systemically in your system uh, for its anti-inflammatory properties, you need to cook the turmeric in oil and with um, uh, piperine, that is black pepper. That is great. 
Um, and research has actually also shown that cooked carrots, there is more bioavailability of beta carotene as compared to raw carrots. So, you know, raw carrots may be good to munch on, but, you know, if you really want that, you know, uh, beta carotene for all its, its important role in the body, then you need to cook it. But if you're looking at cruciferous vegetables, you know, these are your broccoli, kale, cauliflower. They provide the most health benefits when they are eaten raw. You know, one study found that sulfur raphane, which is the potent anti-cancer phytonutrient in these vegetables, is about 30% higher in subjects who ate raw as compared to cooked broccoli. You know, that being said, you know, it's difficult to eat um, you know, raw broccoli and raw, raw cauliflower. Um, you know, kale, we can we can mush it up a little bit with olive oil and we can take it raw. But, you know, um, you can steam broccoli and things like cauliflower lightly so that they are crunchy, they're not mushy. And this is a good way to absorb the sulforaphane that is the protective uh, phytonutrient in these vegetables. So there's a lot of factors which, which you know, play into whether raw diet is good, uh, good or uh, cooking is the way to go. And whenever, next slide, please. Um, whenever I'm a little confused of, you know, from our Western world, you know, what to do, I look at our Eastern wisdom. Um, I look at um, Ayurveda uh, from the Indian uh, continent and I look at traditional Chinese medicine. And for them, you know, raw versus cooked, it depends. It depends on the individual. Um, Ayurveda looks at the Agni, at the digestive capacity of the individual, what is the dosha imbalance, you know, they have the three system, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, what are those imbalances, and what stage of life is the patient in, is he young, is he old, is he an adolescent, what, what is it, because as you age, your digestive capacity is going to decrease. So also in traditional Chinese medicine, they look at the person, the level of their stomach and spleen chi the yin and the yang imbalances. So pretty much kind of similar to Ayurveda. Um, next also they look at the season of the year. So raw foods, um, for, specifically uh, for traditional Chinese medicine is cooling. So summers are okay for these, but not during fall and winter. So, you know, again, you know, it depends on the individual what you can do with either raw or cooked. Next slide, please. Coming back to improving the bioavailability, um, you know, spices are a great way to add flavor. Uh, these are teeming with potent chemical constituents and they aid in digestion and assimilation of food. You know, there are so many different spices. Every culture has their own spice. And, you know, we can discuss hours and hours on all the different spices. But we are going to talk about three major um, spices that we are common. We use it commonly. We are familiar with. Um, next slide, please. Um, so ginger. You know, ginger is, we love ginger, right? I mean, if I could rename myself, I, could, I would rename myself ginger. It's an amazing root. You know, there are so many beneficial properties. It's warming, um, it's anti-nausea, um, it's proven to be anti-emetic in chemotherapy patients in first trimester of pregnancy um, for migraine headaches. It's pro-motility, so it's great for patients with gastroparesis, um, and it helps in digestion and assimilation by enhancing the secretion of our digestive juices, including the hydrochloric acid in our stomach. Next is uh, garlic, you know, uh, the allium it belongs to this allium family of, of vegetables. It is phenomenal. We love garlic. It is a very potent prebiotic, so good for your gut bacteria. It is antioxidant. Um, the studies for its antihypertensive and antilipidemic effects are kind of mixed. Um, but it's, you know, I add it, I use it a lot in my cooking because I just love the taste of it. And I, I know that it, it's, uh, it's also a very good, and you know, anti-infective agent, you know. Um, allicin is the principal compound in garlic. And the best way to cook with garlic is to chop it brush it and put it a little bit of olive oil and just leave it aside for about 15 minutes and then add it at the end of your cooking. This way, all the enzymes, all this, you know, allicin will be intact in your food and you will reap the benefits. 
Um, and the third spice is that uh, you know we have a, uh, uh, we we all like it's black pepper. We are we are familiar with it. We like it, uh, but it's actually called the king of spices. And you know its active constituent is piperine. Again, a very potent antioxidant, anti-mutagenic, so great for prevention of cancer. Um, and it en enhances also our digestive enzymes, including the hydrochloric acid. So patients with gastritis, you've got to be a little bit careful as to how much you're going to recommend. Um, but be uh, because of its uh, effect on the digestive enzymes, it increases the bioavailability of phytonutrients, specifically for curcumin and also for beta carotene. You know, the absorption is 10 or 100 times better if you, um, you know, sprinkle some black pepper on your, on your cooked carrots. Next slide, please. Um, next, coming to fermented foods. You know, this is, again, an easy and a tasty way to increase the bioavailability. And now we have so much variety. We have kimchi, yogurt, kefir sauerkraut, pickles, miso, you know, the list goes on. So we have a lot of variety. Um, and how do these fermented foods work? They work on a microbiome. Next slide, please. Um, and so, you know, the gut bacteria, that's where they primarily work. It's, they're good for, they're good probiotics for a gut bacteria. And this way they enhance the digestion and the absorption of our nutrients uh, so we can live better. And, you know, there is so much research on gut microbiota, you know, it's communication with our neurons, with our brain, with the human immune uh, system. So including fermented foods in your meals is a win-win situation. You will reap so many benefits doing that. Uh, miso is an interesting uh, fermented soy, you know, these fermented koji, and this is obviously comes from Japan. Um, and a lot of research has been done with miso specifically. Uh, in 2003, a study was done from Japan where they looked at uh, the consumption of soy and the incidence of breast cancer in females between 40 and 59 years of age. And what they found was an inverse relationship. If you drank more miso, there was less risk of uh, breast cancer. Um, and recently in 2021, another study again from Japan was done looking at miso and cardiovascular disease. And what they again found was an inverse relationship. But this time, this inverse relationship was more pronounced in women. You know, it helped with the cardiovascular parameters in women as compared to men. Next slide, please. So coming to anti-nutrients, and there are so many anti-nutrients in our environment and they are in our food. So uh, let's see how we can reduce um, the stuff that is not good for us to end up in our system. Next slide, please. Um, a quick, I mean, an easy way, I shouldn't say quick, but an easy way of decreasing anti-nutrients is eating locally, eating local grown foods and seasonal food, foods, foods. You know, the seasonal foods are fresher, tastier, they are full of nutrients. You don't need long transportation. It is good for our community. So eating foods at the time of harvest just makes so much sense. Um, seasonalfoodguide.org is a good resource to know the food, which foods are in season in your geographic area. Um, and obviously eat organic as, you know, as much as possible you can, um, you know, but follow the EWG uh, recommendations to decrease your pesticide exposure. So this is, is one of the ways that we can decrease the anti-nutrients. Um, next slide, please. Doctor. Hardest Malani, we should try to wrap up so that sure, sure, sure. Longer, and then we can have a discussion too. That'd be very important. Sure, sure, sure. Um, Thank you. Sure, sure, sure. So um, another important way is, you know, don't put this entree with the plastic. You know, there's going to be leaching of, of EPA phthalates in this. And so don't do that. Um, this will be a good way to decrease your anti-nutrients. When you're looking at dairy and egg, you know, going for the grass fed rather than the grain fed is a good way to do it uh, because it has more conjugated linoleic acid. You have more um, goodness of omega threes in that. And wild caught fish is definitely better than farm raised fish, right? I mean, there's more vitamins and nutrients, although you get equal amount of omega three fatty acids with that. And then we love to, you know, grill our meats, but grilling meats on high flame is not the best way to do it. You have these bad chemicals that are released. So the best is use, don't use flame, use gas, marinate your meats before you cook them, because this way these, these bad chemicals, which are mutagenic, are going to be decreased. 
Um, next, coming to trans fats and you know, high fructose corn syrup, I don't need to say anything more. Trans fats increase your cardiovascular disease risk and high fructose corn syrup, we do know that it increases your risk for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome and other bad stuff. So this packaged foods is something that we should avoid. The third principle is, you know, satiety and satisfaction. So there are, including, you know, every meal should contain these uh, meats or some lean meat or high fiber foods like pulses, good fats, carbohydrates, that will keep you satiated. So you don't need to go to snack. You know, you are satiated for a good three to four hours and snacking is not the best thing that we do. Um, and, you know, meals should be appealing. You know, they should appeal to our senses, visually, you know, all these cues to our brain rev up our digestive system. So we will eat healthy and we will digest our nutrients, our food better and absorb our nutrients. So in summary, healthy foods and tasty foods are not mutually exclusive. While cooking, think of how to increase bioavailability of nutrients and how to decrease anti-nutrients. And meals should be as colorful as possible and should appeal to our senses. And how we eat is equally important as to what we eat. So with that, bon appetit. And <laughs> sorry if I went over. That's okay. Thank you so much. No, that, was, that was a brilliant discussion. And we appreciate your time and your expertise. Um, we're going to bring in next Dr. Walter Longo. And I believe he's online. I see him right there. Perfect. And Dr. Longo is the Edna M. Jones Professor of Gerontology and Biological Sciences and Director of the Longevity Institute at the University of Southern California, Leonard Davis School of Gerontology. And the Longo Laboratory has published key findings on dietary interventions, including fasting for longevity. And so I will pass it over to Dr. Longo uh, for his presentation. And then at his conclusion, we will have a q and I've seen a number of questions come through the chat already. Uh, we were, were scheduled to go till one, but if there's questions and people want to stay a little bit after, and both the presenters can, we can go a little bit after one o'clock, So, um, which will also be recorded and available to everybody who uh, signed up for the event. All right. So without any further ado, Dr. Longo. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, so I'll um, start with the disclosures. Um, and so I, I always start with this uh, slide about how much longer will we live uh, if we cure cancer. <clears throat> and I often uh, get the 20 years longer, 25 years longer. But in fact, if you cure cancer completely today, we will live about an extra 3.2 years. And um, and even more surprising, if you cure cancer, heart disease, stroke, and diabetes, uh, we will only live an extra 13 years. And, um, and so the aging field in USC is, uh, has been a, a leader for, for more than half a century in the research on, on aging. Um, and, um, and so USC uh, is focused on, on longevity and, and aging. And, and so this is a, a somewhat of a speculation, but it's a speculation based on the ability, our ability or the ability of some laboratories to, um, to extend the lifespan of, of mice. Uh, so if we were health as effective in extending the human lifespan um, and health span as we had done for mice, then uh, um, we could add 30 years uh, to the uh, human life. And so how do we get there? Um, and uh, often journalists like to talk about um, what the centenarians uh, say. There was the the, um, the formula to to get to 100, and, and this is a woman from uh, Los Angeles who got to 115, and um, stated that um, her uh, secret for the uh, for her life uh, span it was never drinking or fooling around. And, um, and then um, you have on the opposite uh, side, you have uh, Madame Calmont, who makes it to 122 years of age uh, and uh, smokes until 117 and um, does not have a very healthy uh, lifestyle. So, um, so for, for Madame Calmont, we know that um, probably just like for Emma Morano, who I followed until she, she got to 117 in Italy, um, we know that there's usually genetics, very powerful genetic factors. And, um, and so lots of family members made it to 100 or, or more. 
Uh, and but for most people, um, most people don't have this benefit. Don't don't are not born. Most of us are not born with uh, uh, centenarian genes. And so the um, uh, and if you look at the aging field um, and you look at the last hundred years, I would say most of my colleagues will agree that nutrition has been the most effective way to extend the lifespan of almost any organism that you can think of. So drugs uh, have, have done some, uh, have been shown to have some benefits, uh, very few drugs, but in most cases has been nutritional interventions and particularly those that involve some type of restriction um, have been very successful. But so if you look at um, uh, one of these studies in monkeys, um, so these monkeys uh, are, are placed on, on a 25% reduction of calories. So the diet is kept the same, a Western-like diet, uh, the calories are reduced by 25%. And just reducing the calories by 25%, uh, as you can see, um, it reduces the uh, diabetes from uh, uh, 60% uh, uh, to about diabetes or insulin resistance from 60% to about 5% in the calories of the monkeys. Um, actually, this is an old slide. And tumors uh, reduced by about 50%, and cardiovascular disease reduced by 20 to 30%. So just a restriction of calorie below the, the, a normal level of calorie, not, be, not below an excess level of calories. So 25% uh, restriction of calories is able to revolutionize uh, the, um, the disease incidence in, in these monkeys. Uh, but if you look at, so this is age-related mortality, so the, the deaths caused by diseases like diabetes, cancer, and cardiovascular disease. And, uh, but this is the all-cause mortality. So if you look at all-cause mortality, these monkeys did not do so well. They did better they, on calorie restriction if they were not calorie restricted, but they did not do uh, as, as well as you would expect. So how can it be that they have all these effects uh, on diseases um, and don't live that much longer? And I already hinted at that with the, with the first slide on cancer. Uh, curing cancer and longevity. So there's a lot of, lots of things that, that affect um, our, our, our ability to make it to 100 or 110 healthy. And, uh, um, and so uh, the, um, the calorie restriction studies were done actually by the first one by my mentor back in the PhD days at UCLA, uh, Roy Walford. And, and Roy had done the first human study on calorie restriction. So what happens if you take people in this case, the first study was done with eight people, but these this results have been confirmed with, uh, by, uh, from lots of studies that have been done since then. Uh, so Roy went into this Biosphere 2 uh, area in, in the desert of Arizona, and, they, and there he conducted the first uh, um, human calorie restriction study where they saw effects on, on risk factors for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and, um, and I'll just show you some here is the, uh, I hope you can see my, my pointer. Here's the, um, the moment where they uh, enter the biosphere two and you see that, and they become color restricted and you see the fasting glucose goes from 90 to down to 70. Uh, systolic blood pressure goes from 110 to 90. Cholesterol, total cholesterol goes from 185, 190 to 125. Um, so you can look at this and you can say, this is incredible. These people are gonna live forever. Or you can look at this and, and say, maybe, Maybe not, right? Maybe they're, they've been pushed to a limit. Maybe it's not so good to have a blood pressure of 90 over 55 um, or a cholesterol, the, a total cholesterol of 125. So, um, so, and in fact, if you look at Walford on the left, and Wal this is Walford, um, while he was calorie restricted in, in, in Biosphere 2, and Walford, the very healthy Wal Walford on the right, when he was eating normally and, 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 and Walford was eating very well. So obviously um, Walford in the color state years and two years um, was pushed to the edge and maybe over the edge. Um, and so then the question becomes, how do you get these benefits of, of this color restriction without having this, all these problems and problems in terms of, you know, of course, losing weight, losing muscle mass, but also uh, probably uh, side effects, which may include immune uh, dysfunction or, or immune suppression and, um, and, and maybe susceptibility to, to, to infections. Um, so, so our answer has been the fasting-making diet. So what happens if you 
have a five day uh, once every three or four months um, of a fasting mimicking diet um, that is low calorie, low sugar, low protein, high in certain carbohydrates and high in, in good fats. And it's a plant-based uh, nutrition. And, and so, and this was developed originally because uh, we started uh, um, studies on cancer patients at USC and uh, the cancer patients did not want to do a water only uh, diet. Um, and so uh, together with chemotherapy and so um, the, the government uh, funded the research on, on fasting making diets. So, uh, and the fasting making diet matched the changes that the water only fasting causes in the, in the blood. Uh, so in mice, to make a long story short, um, if you start at middle age, it makes the mice live longer. It also reduces the cancers by, by uh, the tumors by about 50%, the, the dermatitis uh, by about 50%, and lots of other benefits, including cognitive improvement. And this was uh, two days of the fasting making diet done, uh, I mean, four days of the fasting making diet done twice a month. And... Um, um, and also uh, one thing, I'm just gonna show a few slides on mice. Um, this is a study on diabetes and I'll just uh, summarize it by saying, uh, in, in addition to being very uh, um, uh, potent against the type two type diabetes, so reversing insulin resistance and, and, uh, um, and, and protecting mice from hyperglycemia, um, it also uh, started show, uh, showing another effect of fat Fasting refeeding cycles, which is, um, and I, I won't go into the details, but just to say that we, if we damage, when we damage the pancreas of a mouse, and then to the point that it's no longer making insulin, and then we started the cycles of the fasting making diet and refeeding, and now the, the pancreas is slowly beginning to regenerate new beta cells, uh, insulin producing beta cells, to the point that after a couple of months, the pancreas goes from completely dysfunctional to completely uh, and normally functioning. Um, and so we started seeing in many papers that we published that the, the, the fasting refeeding cycle uh, are able to uh, eliminate damaged cells, turn on stem cells and other intracellular components, and, and then during the refeeding generate new cells or, or rejuvenated cells or more functional cells. And, um, and here, uh, a slide showing uh, this effect. And so the green is, is showing the, the height of the, the level of this uh, gene expression. So how um, uh, high are, how active are these genes, right? And, and so you see that on the normal diet, it's all green, meaning they're very inactive. Um, but if you do the fasting making diet, you see all these genes being turned on. And these genes have to do with the development of the pancreas in the first place, right? So when, the, when we are first born, all these genes are turned down to generate the pancreas. And, uh, and you see now all of a sudden with the fasting making diet, all these are turned down. And after one day of refeeding with the normal diet, there's still a lot of them are turned down. So there is a, a, a reprogramming of the pancreas into a regenerative um, mode or, or a generative mode. Okay, so uh, what happens in, in people, and we ran a, a trial at, at USC a few years ago. Now we repeated this trial uh, two or three times uh, uh, with, in different places uh, and confirmed all the results I'm about to show you. Uh, but essentially, this low calorie, et cetera, uh, fasting making diet done only for five days a month for three months, consecutive months. And then the rest of the time, we allow the, the, the subjects uh, to eat normally, whatever they normally ate. We did not give them any. Uh, instructions on, on diet or exercise, but they had to consume the content of this fasting mimicking diet once a month for five days, for three months. And, uh, and you see here, the loss of body weight, abdominal fat, where circumference, but the most in interesting thing is, is no loss of lean body mass. So the muscle mass is preserved. So everything is, so, so it's targeting the fat and particularly the fat um, that is deposited in the abdomen but it's not uh, uh, touching the, um, the lean body mass, the muscle mass. Uh, and differently from what I showed you earlier from calorie restriction, um, you see the fasting glucose, those subjects that started with normal uh, glycemia, nothing happened. If they're pre-diabetic, then most of them return to the, to the normal glucose level. IGF-1, a, a risk factor, a potential risk factor for cancer, a marker for, for cancer, Again, a normal subject, um, not much happens. 
uh, but uh, um, those that were uh, the high levels of IGF-1 to begin with, they have a much uh, uh, larger drop. Uh, C-reactive protein, a protein, a marker for systemic inflammation. Again, nothing happens in those that start normal and, uh, and, 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 and most of those that start high with the systemic inflammation, they return to, to the normal range. And, and I'm just gonna end with, with this slide where we've always heard, especially in, the, in, in our cancer studies that the, the worry about oncologists, about weight loss and in the cancer patients and actually in this trial, that we finished last year in, in, in two trials that we finished last year in Europe, um, the, uh, the, the many cycles, the fasting in diet did not lower the hand grip. These are women that were receiving hormone therapy for breast cancer. At the phase angle, actually muscle function went up and, and muscle mass went up. And this uh, was thanks to also some light uh, weight training exercise in a, in a healthy diet in between cycles of the fasting making diet. But again, as I just showed you, the fat mass went down. So now gaining a muscle function, muscle mass, and loss of, of uh, uh, fat mass. So, um, so we think, obviously, that this has a lot of potential for both uh, uh, healthy subjects and, and, and those with uh, a series of diseases. And uh, so disease uh, risk, diet, aging, toxins, and, and we now have uh, lots of evidence that the fasting-making diet is able to... Um, to reduce uh, the, the, the damage and, and the risk for disease in part by rejuvenating uh, multiple systems. And uh, I'm just gonna end here. Wonderful, thank you very much, Dr. Longo. That was also an excellent presentation and I think really raised a lot of the issues uh, that people are wondering about as well as uh, the first presentation. So. I, um, I wanna say a couple of things before we open it up to the floor, which is one, I appreciate you both jumping on this, this call, this lecture series and uh, partnering with us here at IHW. Also, obviously illuminating very important issues in the nutrition world. Uh, people are constantly asking these questions um, and wondering about that as it impacts their health and their, their wellness. I know that Dr. Longo, I believe is in Italy right now. So it's nine hours. Are you nine hours ahead of us? Yes. Yeah, so, so I want to say thank you for doing this at uh, almost 10 o'clock at night, you know, um, and we appreciate that. And I want to say thank you for both of you being here today. And there are a number of questions in the chat. I will try to scroll back up here um, and start with um, some of the questions that were posted. And we, we're letting everybody in so that they can uh, participate in the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. if they want to ask the question themselves. People, let's see. Um, somebody asked about dark chocolate treats a cough acutely as a uh, medicinal sort of intervention. I thought that was a really interesting point that was raised. So thank you for raising that. The studies comparing nutrition um, or organic versus conventional, were they looking at the macronutrients only? They actually looked at the micronutrients also, you know, so the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the vitamins, the minerals. So it wasn't just the main macronutrients, it was it was everything. Okay, that's perfect. Thank you very much. In your practice, what is the role of dietary supplements such as ginger, garlic, black pepper, turmeric, and others? So supplements versus actual... Yeah. So, you know, when it comes to patient care, so for things such as rheumatoid arthritis, obviously I don't have patients with rheumatoid arthritis, but my colleagues do. And for, you know, when you need something to treat for a condition like rheumatoid arthritis, you need tons of curcumin. So that you're not going to obtain by cooking with curcumin. You have to put like, you know, you know buckets full of, of turmeric to be able to get that much curcumin. So I definitely do recommend, um, you know, supplements, uh, but the liposomal ones and with biopirine. So many of these uh, nutraceutical uh, supplements now have this biopirine that is a black pepper chemical constituent. Why? Because it, it en enhances the absorption. So if you're looking for curcumin, look for the liposomal with Bioperine. Um, for ginger, again, you know, you're looking for the potent anti-inflammatory benefits. Again, for you know conditions like osteoarthritis and stuff like that, you need a, a huge dose. So again, and for anti-emesis, you know, you want to take supplements. Uh, but for the most part, cooking make that a ritual. Okay, thank you very much. We had a question about the fasting days. Were they consecutive in your research? Um, does that matter when in 
um, month subject when months in, within a month if a subject is fasting, are you looking at daily, consecutive it, days? These uh, the ones we tested were five day five consecutive days of a fasting mimicking diet, and the the practice now. Um, you know, doctors and, and nutritionists are, are recommending it based on uh, on the need to uh, need to do it, right? So it doesn't necessarily need to be done at any frequency. It could just be done for three cycles uh, to to deal with certain uh, conditions. Uh, one of one of which can be uh, uh, abdominal uh, fat. Yeah. Okay. Do you think? Um, fasting as a fad is as effective as intermittent fasting, and how do you like to best define that? Best define intermittent fasting? Yes. Well, intermittent fasting, I mean, fasting doesn't uh, really mean anything. I always say it's kind of like saying eating, you know. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there are, diff there are a few different ones. One is called time-restricted eating. And the best thing to do there is 12 hours of fasting every day, 12 hours of eating seems to be the safest. I mean, there is, you could do 16 hours, but it's harder to do and less safe and lots of side effects associated with it. Um, then there is a few more, which I don't really recommend, which is alternate day fasting, uh, another form of intermittent fasting and something called 5-2, that's two days a week, too frequent. Uh, and most people are never going to be able to continue it. And then there is what, what I talk about, which is periodic fasting, uh, something that you do maybe two or three times a year for five days uh, with a fasting making diet. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, of course it's, very, it's invasive, but in a very limited way, 15 days a year at the most for most people. And, um, and although, for example, we just finished a trial with diabetes patients in which they did it every month, right? Once a month uh, for 12 cycles, right? So, so but, but for people that don't have diseases, uh, then the, there is this periodic fasting. And usually journalists like to call them all intermittent fasting, so. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was some of the questions. Okay, excellent. Um, are there studies available which show proven effectiveness of cooking on health outcomes? No, so that is, you know, um, we, we have some data, but it's not that robust and definitely some more studies need to be done to actually see whether, you know, these cooking practices had had what kind of health outcomes did they have? Was it in a positive direction? These are difficult studies to do, mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully we'll get some data soon. Okay, thank you. Let me see here. I have a... Uh, Here. Curious how to manage or find time to effectively discuss and counsel patients, seeing that there are often physician time limits as little as 15 minutes per, lip, per visit. So the question really is, how do you counsel patients about the advantages of nutrition and cooking and eating and et cetera, when you only have a 15 minute consult? You know, um, going into this uh, field, I felt, you know, very challenged. How am I going to do it? But surprisingly in my practice, I mean, patients, it's such a, you know, uh, people driven, you know, um, field that they are asking me, hey, doctor, how can, can we do something natural, something in food? Um, you know, and in Downey, where I practice, you know, we have a very, um, you, you know, a population, primarily a Hispanic population, and they are very eager to listen to these kind of, uh, so, you know, it's not that difficult for me, even in the 15 minutes, um, mm -hmm. you know, it just takes me five minutes to be able to discuss things with them and they get it, you know, they get it pretty easily. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Dr. Longo, your FMD intervention seems like a quicker fix as in only impacting a few days every month rather than overall diet quality. Um, do your inter do your intervention versus control groups compare FMD to a baseline optimized diet or just the patient's standard diet? Both, right? So the, the, we just finished one against the Mediterranean diet, and um, and it was interesting. Um, they lots of the changes were comparable, uh, but uh, one interesting difference was uh, uh, muscle loss, right? So. Lots of muscle loss in the Mediterranean diet. And again, we saw no difference uh, in uh, absolute lean body mass in the FMD group. Right? So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's certainly uh, in addition to having to do it only for, for five days a month, 
um, there was also an interesting uh, change uh, um, compared to the Mediterranean diet. Okay, wow. thank you. Is there a difference between water only fasting and fasting with green tea, like no cream or sugar? Are there any, is there any data on those comparisons, green tea versus water fasting? Um, I would say uh, that I wouldn't improvise uh, uh, any type of, you know, water only fast. I've done it once. And, uh, um, and so, so most clinics will say for something like that, you need to be in a clinic that is specialized for, for water only fasting. Uh, water only fasting, you know, can cause hypotension, uh, hypoglycemia, et cetera, et cetera. It doesn't mean that lots of people cannot do it, uh, but uh, in the long run, uh, you're going to get into trouble. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and trouble can can include the big trouble. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would say that don't. I mean, uh, fasting is. I always say. I always challenge everyone, including people that are listening now, find something that causes more gene expression changes than fasting. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I you know I never in in 15 years or or more I never got uh, anybody to even come up with some possibility, right? So it really revolutionized your metabolism. Your brain after five days on, on a fasting uh, is now 50% functioning on ketone bodies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it's very big effects, right? And then your whole body now is, is functioning on ketone bodies and fatty acids. So, yeah, so I wouldn't uh, try to improvise with tea or, or, or water only fasting. I mean, you know, of course, if you come from a culture that has always done something for one day a week or something like that, yes. uh, I'm not going to tell the, the people that they grew up like that to, to change, mm -hmm. but I would say for everybody else, uh, yeah, stick with the things that have been tested clinically. Now, the FMD has been tested in, in 10 different clinical trials, uh, really no severe side effects in any of the trials, uh, including the cancer trials. So I think it's, I would go that way uh, and hopefully have, a, have it uh, enter, you know, standard uh, care at some point in the future. Wonderful. Thank you. Here's a question for both of you, and then I think we have to wrap up. Um, have there been studies on what you're talking about with children, either fasting or culinary medicine? Has there been any work published in the pediatric space? Well, culinary medicine, again, you know, the data is not that robust because just because the studies, it's difficult to do this kind of health outcome studies. So as for adults in children, we don't have that kind of robust information. Hopefully, we'll have some studies in the near future. Okay. If for, for FMD, uh, what, the first one is starting after many years of discussion with CHLA and the, the oncologist there. But we've always been very worried about uh, doing this with children for, with, with cancer. But so we're starting with type 1 diabetes now in the Gasoline Children's Hospital in Genova, uh, one of the leading uh, children's hospitals in, in Italy. And now CHLA, they're writing the protocol as we speak. I just got one version today. And so at CHLA, we think uh, the, the plan is to do it, um, for, I think, 14 to 18-year-olds um, with the idea of what if you intervene maybe once every two months, I think that's what it was, um, with five days of this fasting mimicking diet, uh, could this have a dual effect, one a, a acute effect on, on the child, but also a long-term sort of education effect mm -hmm. um, in, in, you know, sort of like... Uh, educate the, the child about a, a vegan diet. So five days of a very healthy vegan diet. And, and of course, there could be negative things. So we'll see. But hopefully, yes. hopefully not. We haven't seen it in adults, but uh, you never know. Right? So Sure. Yeah. Children are not little adults, right? As we know. Mm, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank everybody. Uh, first and foremost, both of you for presenting today. This was a brilliant presentation and discussion. I appreciate all of your time in preparation for today's uh, symposium. And I wanna thank everybody who participated. I think we had about, um, about 93 participants today at our peak. So that was terrific. We will be certain to circulate the link to everybody who registered for the, uh, the symposium today. And then it will also be available on our website. So I, I encourage people to go to our website at USC IIHW and uh, sign up on our listserv and become a member in the community and continue to come to our quarterly uh, symposium. And uh, I look forward to seeing many of you and all of you and more in the future. And again, my, my heartfelt thank you to both of you for presenting today on a very important topic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you. All right, everybody have a great day.
Good to.